Crime and Punishment By Fyodor Dostoevsky Part 1 Chapter 3 He woke up late the next day after a broken sleep. But his sleep had not refreshed him, he waked up bilious, irritable, ill-tempered, and looked with hatred at his room. It was a tiny cupboard of a room about six paces in length. It had a poverty-stricken appearance with its dusty yellow paper peeling off the walls, and it was so low-pitched that a man of more than average height was ill at ease in it, and felt every moment that he would knock his head against the ceiling. The furniture was in keeping with the room, there were three old chairs, rather rickety, a painted table in the corner on which lay a few manuscripts and books, the dust that lay thick upon them showed that they had been long untouched. A big clumsy sofa occupied almost the whole of one wall and half the floor space of the room, it was once covered with chintz but was now in rags and served Raskolnikov as a bed. Often he went to sleep on it, as he was, without undressing, without sheets, wrapped in his old student's overcoat, with his head on one little pillow, under which he heaped up all the linen he had, clean and dirty, by way of a bolster. A little table stood in front of the sofa. It would have been difficult to sink to a lower ebb of disorder, but to Raskolnikov, in his present state of mind, this was positively agreeable. He had got completely away from everyone, like a tortoise in its shell, and even the sight of a servant girl who had to wait upon him and sometimes looked into his room made him writhe with nervous irritation. He was in the condition that overtakes some monomaniacs entirely concentrated upon one thing. His landlady had given up sending him in meals for the last fortnight, and he had not thought of expostulating with her, though he went without dinner. Nastasia, the cook and only servant, was rather pleased with the lodger's mood and had entirely given up sweeping and doing his room. Only once a week or so would she stray into his room with a broom. She woke him up that day. Get up, why are you asleep, she called to him. It's past nine, I have brought you some tea, will you have a cup? I should think you're fairly starving. Raskolnikov opened his eyes, started, and recognized Nastasia. From the landlady, eh, he asked, slowly and with a pale face sitting up on the sofa. From the landlady, indeed. She set before him her cracked teapot full of weak and stale tea and laid two yellow sugar lumps beside it. Here, Nastasia, take it please, he said, fumbling in his pocket, for he had slept in his clothes, and taking out a handful of coppers, run and buy me a loaf. And get me a little sausage, the cheapest, at the pork butcher's. The loaf, I'll fetch you this minute, but wouldn't you rather have some cabbage soup instead of sausage? It was capital soup yesterday. I saved it for you yesterday, but you came in late. It's fine soup. When the soup had been brought and he had begun upon it, Nastasia sat beside him on the sofa and started chatting. She was a country peasant woman and a very talkative one. Praskovia Pavlovna means to complain to the police about you, she said. He scowled. To the police? What does she want? You don't pay her money and won't leave the room. That's what she wants, to be sure. The devil, that's the last straw, he muttered, grinding his teeth, no, that would not suit me, just now. She is a fool, he added aloud. I'll go and talk to her today. Fool she is and no mistake, just as I am. But why, if you are so clever, do you lie here like a sack and have nothing to show? One time you used to go out, you say, to teach children. But why is it you do nothing now? I am doing. Raskolnikov began sullenly and reluctantly. What are you doing? Work. What sort of work? I am thinking, he answered thoughtfully after a pause. Nastasia was overcome with a fit of laughter. She was given to laughter, and when anything amused her, she laughed inaudibly, quivering and shaking till she felt ill. And have you made much money by your thinking, she finally managed to articulate. One can only go out to give lessons with boots. And I'm sick of it. 
don't quarrel with your bread and butter. They pay so little for lessons. What's the use of a few coppers, he answered reluctantly, as though replying to his thought. And you want to get a fortune all at once? He looked at her strangely. Yes, I want a fortune, he answered firmly after a brief pause. Don't be in such a hurry, you quite frighten me. Shall I get you the loaf or not? As you please. Ah, I forgot. A letter came for you yesterday when you were out. A letter? For me. From whom? I can't say. I gave three kopecks of my own to the postman for it. Will you pay me back? Then bring it to me, for God's sake, bring it, cried Raskolnikov, incredibly excited, good God. A minute later, the letter was brought to him. That was it, from his mother, from the province of R. He turned pale when he took it. It had been a long while since he received a letter, but another feeling suddenly stabbed his heart. Nastasia, leave me alone, for goodness sake, here are your three kopecks, but for goodness sake, make haste and go. The letter was quivering in his hand, he did not want to open it in her presence, he wanted to be left alone with this letter. When Nastasia had gone out, he lifted it quickly to his lips and kissed it, then, he gazed intently at the address, the small, sloping handwriting, so dear and familiar, of the mother who had once taught him to read and write. He delayed, he seemed almost afraid of something. At last, he opened it, it was a thick heavy letter weighing over two ounces, and two large sheets of notepaper were covered with tiny handwriting. My dear Rodia, wrote his mother, it's two months since I last talked with you by letter, which has distressed me and even kept me awake at night, thinking. But I am sure you will not blame me for my inevitable silence. You know how I love you, you are all we have to look to, down here and I, you are our all, our hope, our one stay. What a grief it was to me when I heard that you had given up the university some months ago for want of means to keep yourself, and that you had lost your lessons and other work. How could I help you out of my 120 rubles a year pension? The 15 rubles I sent you four months ago I borrowed, as you know, from Vasily Ivanovich Varushin, a merchant of this town, on the security of my pension. He is a kind-hearted man and was a friend of your father's. But having given him the right to receive the pension, I had to wait till the debt was paid off, and that is only done so that I've been unable to send you anything all this time. But now, thank God, I believe I shall be able to send you something more, and in fact, we may congratulate ourselves on our good fortune now, of which I hasten to inform you. In the first place, would you have guessed, dear Rodia, that your sister has been living with me for the last six weeks and we shall not be separated in the future. Thank God, her sufferings are over, but I will tell you everything so that you may know how everything has happened and all that we have hitherto concealed from you. When you wrote to me two months ago that you had heard that Downia had a great deal to put up with in the Svidrigailov's house when you wrote that, and asked me to tell you all about it, what could I write in answer to you? If I had written the whole truth to you, I dare say you would have thrown up everything and come to us, even if you had to walk all the way, for I know your character and feelings, and you would not let your sister be insulted. I was in despair myself, but what could I do? And, besides, I did not know the whole truth myself then. What made it all so difficult was that Downia received a hundred rubles in advance, when she took the place of governess in their family on the condition that part of her salary is deducted every month. So it was impossible to throw up the situation without repaying the debt. This sum, now I can explain it all to you, my precious Rodia, she took chiefly to send you sixty rubles, which you needed so terribly then and which you received from us last year. We deceived you then, writing that this money came from Downia's savings, but that was not so, and now I tell you all about it because, thank God, things have suddenly changed for the better, and that you may know how Downia loves you and what a heart she has. At first, Mr. Svidrigailov treated her very rudely and used to make disrespectful and jeering remarks at the table. 
But I don't want to go into all those painful details, not to worry you for nothing when it is all over. In short, despite the kind and generous behavior of Marfa Petrovna, Mr. Svidrigailov's wife, and all the rest of the household, Downia had a tough time, especially when Mr. Svidrigailov, relapsing into his old regimental habits, was under the influence of Bacchus. And how do you think it was all explained later on? Would you believe that the crazy fellow had conceived a passion for Downia from the beginning but had concealed it under a show of rudeness and contempt? Possibly he was ashamed and horrified at his flighty hopes, considering his years as the father of a family, which made him angry with Downia. And possibly, too, he hoped by his rude and sneering behavior to hide the truth from others. But at last, he lost all control. He had the face to make Downia an open and shameful proposal, promising her all sorts of inducements and offering to throw up everything and take her to another estate of his or even abroad. You can imagine all she went through. To leave her situation at once was impossible not only because of the money debt but also to spare the feelings of Marfa Petrovna, whose suspicions would have been aroused, and then Downia would have been the cause of a rupture in the family. And it would have meant a terrible scandal for Downia, too, that would have been inevitable. There were various other reasons why Downia could not hope to escape from that awful house for another six weeks. You know Downia, of course, you know how clever she is and what a strong will she has. Downia can endure a great deal, even in the most difficult cases, she has the fortitude to maintain her firmness. Although we constantly communicated, she did not write about everything for fear of upsetting me. It all ended very unexpectedly. Marfa Petrovna accidentally overheard her husband imploring Downia in the garden and, putting quite a wrong interpretation on the position, blamed her, believing her to be the cause. An awful scene took place between them on the spot in the garden, Marfa Petrovna went so far as to strike Downia, refused to hear anything and was shouting at her for a whole hour, and then gave orders that Downia should be packed off at once to me in a plain peasant's cart, into which they flung all her things her linen and her clothes, all pell-mell, without folding it up and packing it. And a heavy shower of rain came on, too, and Downia, insulted and put to shame, had to drive with a peasant in an open cart all the seventeen versts into town. What answer could I have sent to the letter I received from you two months ago, and what could I have written? I was in despair, I dared not tell you the truth, because you would have been depressed, mortified, and indignant, and yet what could you do? You could only perhaps ruin yourself, and Downia would not allow it, and fill up my letter with trifles when my heart was so full of sorrow, I could not. For a whole month, the town was full of gossip about this scandal, and it came to such a pass that Downia and I dared not even go to church because of the contemptuous looks, whispers, and even remarks made aloud about us. All our acquaintances avoided us, nobody even bowed to us in the street, and I learned that some shopmen and clerks intended to insult us shamefully, smearing the gates of our house with pitch, so the landlord began to tell us we must leave. All this was set going by Marfa Petrovna, who managed to slander Downia and throw dirt at her in every family. She knows everyone in the neighborhood and that month she was continually coming into the town as she is rather talkative and fond of gossiping about her family affairs, and particularly of complaining to all and each of her husbands, which is not at all right, so in a short time she had spread her story not only in the town but over the whole surrounding district. It made me ill, but Downia bore it better than I did, and if only you could have seen how she endured it all and tried to comfort and cheer me up. She is an angel, but by God's mercy, our sufferings were cut short, Mr. Svidrigailov returned to his senses and repented and, probably feeling sorry for Downia, he laid before Marfa Petrovna a complete and unmistakable proof of Downia's innocence, in the form of a letter Downia had been forced to write and give to him before Marfa Petrovna came upon them in the garden. She had written this letter, which remained in Mr. Svidrigailov's hands after her departure, to refuse personal explanations and intimate interviews, for which he was entreating her. 
In that letter, she accused him with great heat and indignation for the baseness of his behavior regarding Marfa Petrovna, reminding him that he was the father and head of a family, and telling him how infamous it was of him to torment and make unhappy a defenseless girl, unhappy enough already. Indeed, dear Rodia, the letter was so nobly and touchingly written that I sobbed when I read it, and to this day, I cannot read it without tears. Moreover, the evidence of the servants, too, cleared Downia's reputation. They had seen and known a great deal more than Mr. Svidrigailov had himself supposed, as indeed is always the case with servants. Marfa Petrovna was completely taken aback and again crushed as she said herself to us, but she was completely convinced of Downia's innocence. The very next day, being Sunday, she went straight to the cathedral, knelt, and prayed with tears to Our Lady to give her strength to bear this new trial and to do her duty. Then she came straight from the cathedral to us, told us the whole story, wept bitterly, and, fully penitent, embraced Downia and her to forgive her. The same morning without delay, she went round to all the houses in the town and everywhere, shedding tears. She asserted in the most flattering terms Downia's innocence and the nobility of her feelings and behavior. Moreover, she showed and read to everyone the letter in Downia's handwriting to Mr. Svidrigailov and even allowed them to take copies of it, which I think was superfluous. In this way, she was busy driving about the whole town for several days because some people had taken offense through precedence given to others. And therefore, they had to take turns so that in every house, she was expected before she arrived. Everyone knew that on such and such a day, Marfa Petrovna would be reading the letter in such and such a place, and people assembled for every reading of it, even many who had heard it several times already both in their own houses and other people's. In my opinion, much of this was unnecessary, but that's Marfa Petrovna's character. Anyway, she succeeded in completely re-establishing Downia's reputation. The whole ignominy of this affair rested as an indelible disgrace upon her husband as the only person to blame. I began to feel sorry for him, it was treating the crazy fellow too harshly. Downia was once asked to give lessons to several families, but refused. All of a sudden, everyone began to treat her with marked respect, and all this did much to bring about the event by which, one may say, our whole fortunes are now transformed. You must know, dear Rodia, that Downia has a suitor and that she has already consented to marry him. I hasten to tell you all about the matter, and though it has been arranged without asking your consent, I think you will not be aggrieved with me or with your sister on that account, for you will see that we could not wait and put off our decision till we heard from you. And you could not have judged all the facts without being on the spot. This was how it happened. He is already of the rank of a counselor, Pyotr Petrovich Luzhin, and is distantly related to Marfa Petrovna, who has been very active in bringing the match about. It began with his expressing through her his desire to make our acquaintance. He was properly received, drank coffee with us, and the very next day, he sent us a letter in which he very courteously made an offer and begged for a speedy and decided answer. He is swamped and in a great hurry to get to Petersburg, so every moment is precious to him. At first, we were amazed, as it had all happened so quickly and unexpectedly. We thought about and talked about it over the whole day. He is a well-to-do man to be depended upon, he has two posts in the government and has already made his fortune. He is 45 years old but fairly prepossessing and might still be considered attractive by women. He is very respectable and presentable, only he seems a little sad and somewhat arrogant. But that may only be the impression he makes at first sight. And beware, dear Rodia, when he comes to Petersburg, as he shortly will do, beware of judging him too hastily and severely, as your way is, if there is anything you do not like in him at first sight. I warn you, although I am sure he will make a favorable impression on you. Moreover, to understand any man, one must be deliberate and careful to avoid forming prejudices and mistaken ideas, which are difficult to correct and get over afterward. And Pyotr Petrovich, 
judging by many indications, is a thoroughly estimable man. At his first visit, indeed, he told us that he was a practical man, but still, he shares, as he expressed it, many of the convictions of our most rising generation, and he is an opponent of all prejudices. He said a lot more, for he seems arrogant and likes to be listened to, but this is scarcely a vice. I, of course, understood very little of it, but Downier explained that, though he is not a man of great education, he is clever and seems good-natured. You know your sister's character, Rodia. She is a committed, sensible, patient, and generous girl, but she has a passionate heart, as I know very well. Of course, there is no great love either on his side or on hers, but Downia is a clever girl with the heart of an angel and will make it her duty to make her husband happy, who on his side will make her happiness his care. Of that, we have no good reason to doubt, though it must be admitted the matter has been arranged in great haste. Besides, he is a man of great prudence, and he will see, to be sure of himself, that his happiness will be more secure the happier Downier is with him. And as for some defects of character, for some habits and even certain differences of opinion, which indeed are inevitable even in the happiest marriages, Downier has said that, as regards all that, she relies on herself, that there is nothing to be uneasy about, and that she is ready to put up with a great deal if only their future relationship can be an honorable and straightforward one. He struck me, for instance, at first as rather abrupt, but that may come from his being outspoken, and that is no doubt how it is. For instance, at his second visit, after he had received Downia's consent, in the course of conversation, he declared that before making Downia's acquaintance, he had made up his mind to marry a girl of good reputation without dowry and, above all, one who had experienced poverty, because, as he explained, a man ought not to be indebted to his wife, but that a wife should look upon her husband as her benefactor. I must add that he expressed it more nicely and politely than I have done, for I have forgotten his actual phrases and only remember the meaning. And, besides, it was not said of the design but slipped out in the heat of conversation so that he tried afterward to correct himself and smooth it over. But all the same, it did strike me as somewhat rude, and I said so afterward to Downia. But Downia was vexed and answered that, words are not deeds, and that, of course, is perfectly true. Downia did not sleep all night before she made up her mind, and, thinking that I was asleep, she got out of bed and walked up and down the room all night, at last, she knelt before the icon and prayed long and fervently, and in the morning she told me that she had decided. I have mentioned already that Pyotr Petrovich is just setting off for Petersburg, where he has a great deal of business and wants to open a legal bureau. He has been occupied for many years in conducting civil and commercial litigation, and only the other day, he won a critical case. He has to be in Petersburg because he has a significant issue before the Senate. So, Roger dear, he may be of the most effective use to you, in every way indeed. And Downia and I have agreed that from this very day, you could enter upon your career and might consider that your future is marked out and assured for you. Oh, if only this comes to pass. This would be so beneficial that we could only consider it a providential blessing. Downia is dreaming of nothing else. We have even ventured to drop a few words on the subject to Pyotr Petrovich. He was cautious in his answer and said that, of course, as he could not get on without a secretary, it would be better to be paying a salary to a relationship than to a stranger if only the former were fitted for the duties, as though there could be doubt of your being done. Still, he doubts whether your university studies would leave you time for work at his office. The matter dropped for the time, but Downier thinks of nothing else now. She has been in a sort of fever for the last few days and has already made a regular plan for your becoming, in the end, an associate and even a partner in Pyotr Petrovich's business, which might well be, seeing that you are a student of law. I completely agree with her, Rodia, and I share all her plans and hopes and think there is every probability of realizing them. And despite Pyotr Petrovich's evasiveness, very natural at present, since he does not know you, 
Downia is firmly persuaded that she will gain everything by her good influence over her future husband, this she is reckoning upon. Of course, we are careful not to discuss any more remote plans with Pyotr Petrovich, especially of your becoming his partner. He is a practical man and might take this very coldly, it might all seem to him simply a daydream. Nor has either Downia or I breathed a word to him of the great hopes we have of his helping us to pay for your university studies. We have not spoken of it in the first place because it will come to pass of itself, later on, and he will no doubt without wasting words offer to do it of himself, as though he could refuse Downia that. The more readily since you may by your efforts become his right hand in the office, and receive this assistance not as a charity, but as a salary earned by your work. I agree with her that Downia wants to arrange it all like this. And we have not spoken of our plans for another reason, I mainly wanted you to feel on an equal footing when you first meet him. When Downia told him enthusiastically about you, he answered that one could never judge a man without seeing him close, for oneself, and that he looked forward to forming his own opinion when he makes your acquaintance. Do you know, my precious Rodia, I think that perhaps for some reasons, nothing to do with Pyotr Petrovich though, simply for my personal, perhaps old womanish, fancies, I should do better to go on living by myself, apart, than with them, after the wedding. I am convinced that he will be generous and delicate enough to invite me and urge me to remain with my daughter for the future. If he has said nothing about it hitherto, it is simply because it has been taken for granted, but I shall refuse. I have noticed more than once that husband doesn't quite get on with their mothers-in-law. I don't want to be the least bit in anyone's way, and for my own sake, I would rather be entirely independent, so long as I have a crust of bread of my own and such children as you and Downia. If possible, I would settle somewhere near you for the most joyful piece of news, dear Roger, I have kept for the end of my letter, know then, my sweet boy, that we may, perhaps, be all together in a short time and may embrace one another again after a separation of almost three years. It is settled for sure that Downia and I are to set off for Petersburg, exactly when, I don't know, but very, very soon, possibly in a week. It all depends on Pyotr Petrovich, who will let us know when he has had time to look around him in Petersburg. To suit his arrangements, he is anxious to have the ceremony as soon as possible, even before the Feast of Our Lady, if it could be managed, or if that is too soon to be ready, immediately after. Oh, with what happiness I shall press you to my heart! Downia is excited at the positive thought of seeing you, she said one day in a joke that she would be ready to marry Pyotr Petrovich for that alone. She is an angel! She is not writing anything to you now. She has only told me to report that she has so much, so much to say to you that she is not going to take up her pen now, for a few lines would tell you nothing, and it would only mean upsetting herself, she bids me send you her love and innumerable kisses. But although we shall meet so soon, I may send you as much money as possible in a day or two. Now that everyone has heard that Downia is to marry Pyotr Petrovich, my credit has suddenly improved. I know that Afanasy Ivanovich will trust me now even to 75 rubles on the security of my pension so that perhaps I can send you 25 or even 30 rubles. I would send you more, but I am uneasy about our traveling expenses, for though Pyotr Petrovich has been so kind as to undertake part of the expenses of the journey, that is to say, he has taken upon himself the conveyance of our bags and big trunk, which will be conveyed through some acquaintances of his. We must reckon upon some expense on our arrival in Petersburg, where we can't be left without a halfpenny, at least for the first few days. But we have calculated it all, down here and I, to the last penny, and we see that the journey will be relatively inexpensive. It is only 90 versts from us to the railway, and we have agreed with a driver we know to be in readiness, and from there, Downia and I can travel quite comfortably third class so that I may be able to send you not 25, but 30 rubles. But enough, I have covered two sheets already, and there is no space left for more, 
our whole history, but so many events have happened. And now, my precious Rodia, I embrace you and send you a mother's blessing till we meet. Love Downia, your sister, Rodia, love her as she loves you and understands that she loves you beyond everything, more than herself. She is an angel, and you, Rodia, are everything to us, our hope and consolation. If only you are happy, we shall be satisfied. Do you still say your prayers, Rodia, and believe in our Creator's and Redeemer's mercy? I am afraid you may have been visited by the new spirit of infidelity abroad today, if so, I pray for you. Remember, dear boy, how you used to lisp your prayers at my knee in your childhood when your father was living and how happy we all were in those days. Goodbye, till we meet then, I embrace you warmly, with many kisses. Yours till death. Polsheria Raskolnikov. Almost from the first, while he read the letter, Raskolnikov's face was wet with tears, when he finished it, his face was pale and distorted, and a bitter, wrathful, and malignant smile was on his lips. He laid his head on his threadbare dirty pillow and pondered for a long time. His heart was beating violently, and his brain was in turmoil. At last, he felt cramped and stifled in the little yellow room like a cupboard or a box. His eyes and his mind craved space. He took up his hat and went out, this time without dread of meeting anyone, he had forgotten his fear. He turned toward the Vasilyevsky Ostrov, walking along Vasilyevsky Prospect as though hastening on some business. Still, he walked, as his habit was, without noticing his way, muttering and even speaking aloud to himself, to the astonishment of the passers-by. Many of them took him to be drunk. That is the end of chapter 3. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you at the next one.